Sonam, the President and uh, General Counsel of Origin House. Uh, we used to be named Canna Royalty uh, as of three months ago, so you may recognize us from our previous existence. Uh, I'll take you through a little bit about uh, this company, uh, what we're about and uh, where we're trying to go. Um, and as pointed out, we, we really are a brand focused company. That's uh, at the core. Uh, directive for our company and where we're intending to take this company into the future. Uh, so brand, uh, it's something that we talk about a lot nowadays in the cannabis industry and uh, it's a word that I think gets used quite loosely. Um, one of the biggest confusions that people will make uh, in this industry especially is confusing the word product for a brand. A product is a very different thing from a brand. Um, a logo also is not a brand. Same thing with a trademark, same thing with any sort of intellectual property registration, etc. These are all aspects that describe what is deeper. Um, a brand is really this process that happens that allows me to show you that bottle over there and then have something flash into your head and really pull up a lot of imprinting that's been done. So. A brand, one way to describe it is, is as a relationship or as a, as a construct in a, in a consumer's mind. Um, what it represents effectively is some form of mind share. Uh, from an economic perspective, a brand is something a little bit different. If you wanted to describe what a brand meant from an economic perspective, uh, one of the simple ways that I, I try and describe for people is by also pointing to Coca-Cola and uh, pointing out that this bottle might sit on the shelf for a price of one dollar and you could find products like RC Cola that are not quite branded the same way and don't put the money in there that sit on the shelf for 75 cents a, sh uh, a bottle and that delta between the value is your brand value. Um, and that's how you can economically describe a brand. All that to say is that this is a concept that has very little to do with registrations, logos, and anything on paper, and more to do with this trust and economic relationship that forms over a very long period of time. And the frank reality is, is that the cannabis industry does not yet have something that most traditional people would even call brands. We have had companies that have been around for quite some time, but the conditions and the indicia that actually describe and uh, confirm that a brand exists aren't there. So having repeatable sell through over an extended period of time, along with uh, an above market pricing uh, is, and those are the, the few characteristics that you'll typically point to. And there's no evidence that that's actually happened in this industry. So, we, so we spend a lot of time thinking about brand because we believe that that is something that's going to have a lot of long-term value in this industry and that's why we focused our company on that concept of being a brand's company. Our long-term aspiration is to look like one of these uh, types of models. So there, it's a common model to see these houses of brands, you can see them in any type of uh, product category ranging from, I think we've got alcohol and some consumer products lifestyle brands, et cetera, to tobacco, to just general things. The common logic over here is that when you build a channel through which to sell and market and distribute products, it's foolish not to put a lot more products through it because you're able to benefit from the synergies and the sunk costs and the fixed costs you've already put into building that whole structure. So the logic underlying this House of Brands model uh, in the traditional world is relatively apparent. Our aspiration is to be one of those companies in five or 10 years. And I think that's an aspiration that you're gonna hear a lot in the cannabis industry from a variety of different players. Uh, what makes us not just a little bit, but quite different is the way that we approach it and uh, what we truly believe brands actually are. Um, so more on that. This is something that I put up uh, on these presentations just to, to reinforce that concept that I was mentioning too about brands not really existing in this space yet. What you're going to see if you peel back the data in any open and competitive environment and anywhere in the US or across the world for the cannabis markets is what I mentioned earlier, brands don't exist yet. Um, what you're gonna see is typically a rotating door where you might have the brand of the year or the brand of the month or brand of a year or two, 
But there is no company that's actually been able to hold that position for years and years and years in a repeatable way that's gone from one market to the next, uh, be it in Colorado or Washington or Oregon where you've had brands that have come about and then come down over the course of years. It's something uh, that's happened quite a bit. Um, so taking a look at California, for example, you've had pretty substantial changes just over the past few quarters uh, in terms of who's in the lead position for edibles. And just take this out as an example of a company like Plus, for example, that has been tremendously successful in capitalizing on that trend. Um, but as a core point, what it indicates to, to, to us as an observer and a brand uh, operator is the fact that these companies are in the nascent stages of brand building, but again, not quite brands yet, because if you had a brand, you would expect to see some more repeatable and foreseeable results into the future. This has to do with a variety of factors. Uh, we are right now going through literally hundreds of years worth of evolution when you compare us to the alcohol industry, the tobacco industry, et cetera, both in terms of how we offer these products, what the products are, how they're marketed, et cetera. And that's all happening year by year by year. So what you have is literally obsolescence occurring six month cycles over and over again. So when the first person out in Colorado introduced vape pens from cheap e-cigarette hardware and put them on the shelf, they dominated. But the next person that came around and got slightly better e-cigarette hardware, put it onto a shelf, they wiped out that last one so on and so forth, that doesn't happen with Coca-Cola because there really isn't a physically superior version of Coca-Cola. That product has been designed and tinkered with over quite some time so that it's reached the pinnacle of its formulation. And certainly you have companies that will come out with new products, new beverages, et cetera, but nobody's gonna introduce Coca-Cola that is objectively better in the cannabis industry, you do have products that come out that are objectively better one year to the next because we're still improving. And that's part of the reason why very difficult environment to build brands in. So our strategy as a company is uh, divided into three steps to try and capitalize on a lot of these observations uh, that we've made over time. Uh, ultimately, end goal is to be a brand house like I projected uh, a few slides ago, but uh, the way that we're going about it is in a three-phase model. Uh, phase one for us is building a distribution platform in California and becoming the most successful distributor of third-party products in that state. Phase two is operating in parallel with that. And in phase two, we're providing resources and support to the brands that we work with to make them the most competitive brands that are out there in the space. Uh, and that, in a sense, is to try and accelerate their rise to the top or bottom of the pile, uh, so to speak, with this industry. And ultimately, uh, the goal in that phase is to internalize those brands, either through in licensing their intellectual property or acquiring them. Uh, finally, step three is taking this model into other jurisdictions across the globe. Um, US would be their first steps, but we've also jumped into Canada a little bit too. So I'll walk through some more details about why we're taking this strategy, which again is quite different from probably a lot of what you're seeing out there in the market. Uh, before I do that too, this is just a little bit of a snapshot uh, to give you a sense of what our footprint infrastructure, et cetera, looks like. Um, we are, as I mentioned, in phase one uh, and we're plugging ahead quite well as a distributor. Uh, we just dis distribute to the vast majority of dispensaries across the state of California. We have a number of facilities that are there and operational. We've got staff on board that have been operating the industry for years and years and collectively hundreds of years with the cannabis and formalized uh, distribution experience. We've also distributed more brands than virtually any other company that's out there. So through the course of our history, uh, the companies that comprise Origin House right now have distributed over 50 brands and uh, pretty happy with uh, how that process has gone. So phase one, uh, California. Why California? It's not the reason why most people are excited about California. I mean, it is the biggest market in the world and that's nice and obviously important, but certainly not the core reason why we're there. The core reason why we're there is because we're a brand company and we operate in a very odd world where you can't ship products from one state to the next and have open flow. So you gotta tailor your business approach accordingly. 
And when we, when we went through uh, the world markets of cannabis, we found only one jurisdiction that was even ready for branded products, which was California. And what I say ready for branded products, uh, what I'm referring to is really just having the infrastructure and players in place to be able to have open and active competition. So Canada, for example, you don't really have retail, you don't have very much going on with manufacturing, et cetera. It's not ready for brands over and above the fact that they've also tried to make it illegal to market and advertise, et cetera. So challenging to say the least, you go through a lot of the markets on the Northeast and the East, they're still not ready because they're barely just crawling along with getting infrastructure up in place. And most of that is still relatively siloed and vertically integrated. So you don't have the ability for competition to occur. And brands really are important when you have that environment because they are a creature that allows a consumer to make a decision from one product to the next. They don't operate in the way that, like if you're in Florida, for example, and you have a dispensary over here and you only sell your own products and you then have a competitor that sells their own products in their own dispensary, but their dispensary is 100 miles away, your consumer is generally not gonna make that trek. And so those are some of the constituent components that you actually need in order to have a successful brand environment, and frankly, any sort of successful capitalism too. Those are the core products and ingredients uh, that are there. So California for us has been the market that's been operating for 20 plus years in a legal fashion. Um, it's been evolving quite a bit, but deepest and longest history of cannabis cultivation, production, et cetera. Uh, open and free market too. And I'm a lawyer by training and I've familiarized myself with the vast number of regulatory frameworks in a lot of different jurisdictions. This is the one that I would pick if I had to choose as a lawyer one to operate in because it has the least challenging restrictions. Uh, it's got a regulatory environment that is open and welcoming and the regulators sit us down and tell us that they embrace free markets as the force that's gonna evolve their market. Whereas many of the other regulators in other jurisdictions are far more protectionist or just afraid of the cannabis markets generally. So great regulatory environment. Most licenses that are being issued anywhere, they don't view licenses as a commodity because licenses are not a commodity. They are simply an entitlement to do business, straight from the words of the mouth of the California regulators. More importantly as a brand's company is the fact that when you can only operate and focus on one jurisdiction and not have your products sold from one place to the next is the fact that California occupies a pretty unique place in the world uh, in terms of influence and culture. Um, it is a global hub of culture. Uh, in some cases, one of the primary, if not the primary global hubs. More so when you take into account the fact that it has a number of different hubs that emanate or different networks that emanate from it. It's not just media and Hollywood, et cetera, but also things like immense tourism. You've got more tourists that come into California than Nevada or any other jurisdiction across the US with good reason. The state has a lot going on and a whole variety of different uh, offerings there. Over and above that, you've got your information technology hubs and networks that have emanated out of there, et cetera. And so the key takeaway over here is that as a brand producer, if you were told in just the CPG world that you gotta operate in one jurisdiction at a time and you gotta pick one place to go first, and you tried to figure out what is gonna give you the most bang for buck as a brand company, there is no comparison to California because you can launch a brand and it'll be heard everywhere across the world if you do it right from California. You can do that in Canada or Arizona or wherever it might be that you pick your business and try as hard as you might and put millions of dollars in it you might still not ever get that same kind of recognition. So the natural networks that create socio-cultural trends emanate quite strongly from California. Not to say that it's the only place in the world, but again, when you need to try and rank and focus, this is what came up first. Finally, it is relevant to note that this is the most active and discerning market in the world too. Consumers in California, as I pointed out, they've been there and around for quite some time. And for us, it was really important to get into the, the market that had the most competition as opposed to the approach that a lot of the companies out there take right now, which is jumping into markets that have the least competition. Our point is that we want it to be hard right now because that's what's gonna guarantee our success. 
we operate in a vertically constrained monopolistic environment, you might disguise your lack of competition uh, by the fact that you have a vertically in entitled uh, space in that market and you'll be as good as that entitlement is and when that entitlement goes away, you might find that your performance does too. So that's why we're in California and the way that we're operating right now is as, as a distributor primarily. The reason for that is that it allows us to work with a vast number of brands and ultimately be their partner in success and try and drive their success, but also realistically not be their partner in failure and be tied to their failure too. Uh, the reality is that you can't figure out what is going to be on the shelf 10 years from now. If any of us had that crystal ball, we wouldn't be sitting here in any of these investor seminars. We probably wouldn't be sitting here doing any work either. Um, that would be where you'd go off. Given the reality that we know we can't predict who's going to be the, the winning brand out there, our strategy was to operate as a, in a diversified manner by being their distributor. So it allows us to support and work with a multitude of companies uh, and really be the front line for their success and drive our economics that way too. Also allows us to work with a number of retailers and sell across the state. As I pointed out, we're selling into 70 plus percent of the dispensaries in California and that's important uh, because it allows us to sell to every shape and form of consumer and really get to understand what sells. Whereas if you're just a retailer or just a brand, you're only going to know what your pipeline is actually interested in. As a distributor, we got to go into a dispensary in West Hollywood and have the products that sell over there. We've also got to have a the selection of products that sells in Compton or up in Sacramento or out in Humboldt. These are things that no single brand or retailer is ever going to need to grapple with and they become really important over time when you start to think about mapping out demographics for the long term. So this is our model. We distribute products, we put them into dispensaries, we get feedback and then we iterate and we see what's happening in the market and the core of this business and plan is to really be on top of the trends and be able to see where the needle is moving before the rest of the world even has a clue because you might get the data but you're certainly not getting the qualitative and quantitative feedback that we get from operating through dispensaries and operating with 450 dispensaries, which includes both the feedback from the buyers or what they're passing along from the customers, but also what the numbers look like and how they make their decisions. This leads me into uh, the second part of our, our model. Um, this brand support infrastructure is something that we've layered onto that core distribution platform. So that distribution platform allows us to work with a number of different brands in a very productive and financially positive manner because we can be partners in each other's success. We're not looking at each other as you make more money, I lose money or any other variation. It's the more you sell, the more we sell, the more we both make money. And we've layered on this brand accelerator program. Um, this is really an extension of what we were looking to, to build with the distribution platform. But again, it's trying to provide the tools that brands need in order to be successful and put us in the front lines of being the partner for success for the brands that we work with. So our brand accelerator program, we started off a handful of months ago, we started off with the easiest thing that we could do in a sense, which is providing capital to brands. Um, we've now made a handful of investments in the brands we work with where we'll invest into them, uh, not in the form of equity, but in the form of debt. We loan it to them, we're secured against the revenues which flow through us, their products which flow through us, as well as their facilities which we secure things against. So, as an investment, it is probably the lowest risk investment that you could make in the cannabis industry because we're in a position where we could very cleanly step in and mitigate our risk no matter what happens. So it's been a pretty low risk environment for us to deploy capital into third parties that are there trying to develop their own success. And again, when they become successful, we ride on it too. But even if they don't become successful, we're protected from the way that we structured our investments and the fact that we are their sell through that we're going to be in a position that our exposure is relatively minimal. This becomes pretty interesting over time with uh, the, uh, the power of a platform like this because our results aren't tied to producing extra vape pen or edible, etc. It's more tied to the relationships that we, we tie in with brands. So, 
the nice thing is that our revenue can jump up and grow quite uh, quite rapidly by signing up new brands and putting them onto our platform and be able to demonstrate a fair amount of success uh, on the books too in a way that's going to be more challenging for operators that need to literally sell each unit uh, and produce each unit from scratch to finish. I spoke a little bit about this uh, phase two of our model, the, the internalization and acceleration phase, but I'll expand a little bit more on that. Um, capital is what I mentioned, but I should also point out that we've got infrastructure and uh, a lot of support services that we've been building up ourselves for our long-term future as a, as a brand company that we've been now outsourcing to the third-party brands we work with. So when we build up an entire team that's out there to do trade shows and everything else, we're overbuilding it because we know we've got 34 other brands that we work with right now that would benefit from those services too, and in a lot of cases, they will use them. Uh, they can't most of the time afford to pay a few hundred thousand dollars a year as a salary for a CMO and the high quality talent that you need to really drive these types of efforts forward. But in an aggregated model like this, where we act as a centralized brand support function for these brands, the cost is spread among a variety of different players. It allows us to build forward and also recoup a lot of the costs and put those, uh, those resources to good use and develop them over time. So with that, we're really looking to supplement that original model where we started off as a distributor. We're now plowing in resources and support services to ensure that the brands that we work with uh, have all the tools that they need to become the most successful brands in the market or not. Um, and ultimately, again, not all the brands are gonna succeed. And we'd rather help these brands discover whether or not they're gonna make it at an early stage as opposed to see people trickle into the market over a very long period of time and then just find that they've been sucked out and had all their life savings put into a brand that ultimately wasn't going to make it anyways, which is a story we've unfortunately seen in a lot of different markets because it's challenging to say the least and people want to keep pushing forward in this market because the opportunity is huge. Might not be the right thing for everybody. The second half of phase two, uh, or it, the, the title of it is internalize and accelerate. Uh, that internalized component is where things get more interesting for investors and uh, the, the public at large. Um, so our, our strategy is to roll in the brands that we see doing the best over time. Uh, we're confident that given the data and uh, both quantitative and qualitative that we get, we're gonna have a leg up on anybody, regardless of how much data you can get quantitatively out in the market. That qualitative side, we believe, is gonna give us a leg up in actually selecting some of the winners. Over and above that, we've, we really stayed true to the belief that being a partner first for these brands and then having them approach us for partnership and merger is gonna be the way to build a successful business. We're not out there just trying to acquire everything under the sun. I believe that there is a lot more to building a successful business than just trying to roll up assets, it's teams and it's people. And if you don't have those people there and dialed in, especially with brands in their nascent state, I can guarantee you rip out a founder from a brand at its early stages, you're never gonna actually get value out of it into the long term. And so for us, that's critical and something that we approach by being the partner first, developing that trust relationship, and then ultimately leaving it open for the brands to come to us and say whether or not they're interested in anything more. And we've had that happen a number of times over. Uh, the one brand acquisition that we've done is Floracal Farms. They were the most successful product on our distribution platform for the past few years. They were excited by what we were doing. If you take a look at our history, you'll see that we announced a relationship with them to partner on a, a JV of some sort at the beginning of last year. Six months later, we closed an acquisition because partway through that process, they realized they really wanted to join the mothership and we realized that they were phenomenal additions and culture uh, uh, supplementers to our company and that was how we made that deal. And that's how each one of our acquisitions have gone and critically for you as an audience, the thing to appreciate is that that's what's driven the economics on every one of our deals. So the transactions that we've done in the past, they've been on economics that have been unheard of in this cannabis industry. We're doing deals at 1x trailing revenue, which would cause most investors to blanch over here because you just don't see those types of opportunities. It's not because of anything 
secret out there. It's just the fact is that we're entering into these deals with value perceived on our side other than dollars and cents. And that value is created by working as a partner with these brands. And that's why when people ask, what is your guarantee that you're going to buy these companies? The answer is there is no guarantee. And anybody that thinks that a piece of paper is going to be their guarantee can tell you firsthand as a lawyer that that's not going to work. So. Our belief is actually performing and partnering first and then allowing the economics to dictate themselves over time. Important point to note over here is that this process is not just developing very impressive brands, but most importantly uh, is what I mentioned, the ability to serve all demographics out there. So because of the fact that we need to know what sells from top to bottom in this state, we're in a position where we need to understand the demographics of consumers down to the fundamental level. And it's this knowledge that we intend to roll out across the rest of uh, the world, really. Um, so our play is to get into every other state across uh, the US as well as every other jurisdiction across the globe over time. But we're waiting for each market to become mature enough for our business model to succeed and thrive. And what we seek to deploy over there is not just the stable of brands that we're building up in California, the most competitive market in the world, but also the sales marketing and insight that we're developing in California that allows us to serve that entire demographic and new markets that are going to have their own demographics and trends. So that's our third phase of the strategy, which is replicating the blueprint. I'm at, uh, I think, the very end of my timeline over here, so I won't go through this in any sort of detail, but you should take a look at what we've got going on with 180 Smoke. Fascinating case study on how you penetrate a market that's fundamentally broken, being Canada, and develop brands. Uh, and happy to speak at uh, more length about that. But for now, uh, I'll pause and wrap up. Again, our aim is to be a global brands company in the cannabis space. We are taking an approach that's quite different from anybody really that's out there, and we're operating in the largest and most dynamic market in the world. Uh, we're excited about where things are going and uh, looking forward to having a pretty rosy future. So CSC, uh, where symbol is OT, uh, OH, and we're on the OTC as well as ORHOF. Thanks, everybody. I'll take many questions. Absolutely. I think there's almost a half dozen to a dozen different companies that are out there with superficially similar infrastructure, footprint, et cetera. Where I'd point you to is just the fact that being a distribution company isn't about trucks or logistics or anything else. It's about channel, relationship, trust, and knowledge. And so what we went after was not facilities, but Alta Supply, from what our, our understanding, probably the oldest distributor operating in the state of California, River Distribution, first license ever issued for distribution. They shape the regulations, et cetera. We call up the regulators. They come to our offices as opposed to us going there. That's the kind of stuff that really distinguishes us behind the scenes is the fact that we've built up a business as opposed to facilities on paper. The, the way that we take a look at our portfolio, I mean, our basic principle is that a salesperson needs to be able to distinguish one brand to the next and be able to ask the simple question when the dispensary asks them, why do I buy this product versus the next one? So once we can't have an answer to that question is where we're saturated, but the reality is given how complicated consumers are and how varied your targeting can be, you could have a dozen plus products in a single category and still not have meaningful cannibalization. We still haven't seen it yet. And we're also in the point too where I point out that we've seen the second cycle of uh, brands in California start to come out uh, that have had a very different approach from the first cycle that we're out at the beginning of 2018. Trying to call it today and narrow in today is the absolute wrong way to go about it. We still believe that there is a tremendous amount of evolution that is happening right now, and being diversified and being able to see it happen is better than trying to run and chase after it after it has. Yeah. Mm 
Yeah, they've been going ahead. They've actually got, uh, I believe they signed up uh, an agreement uh, with a, a shell and uh, they've got their own CDAR profile. So you can follow along on their story uh, actively and directly over there. Try not to focus on it because we've had an active and storied past. We have been in the, operating in the, uh, the industry for four years and really only started operating this business for a year and a half. And this is what shaped and formed our belief. Being an investor in this industry is what gave us the experience to be able to create this relatively unique approach. We haven't yet monetized the data. Uh, what we have entered into are sharing arrangements with certain parties where we'll give them our data in exchange for a much larger data subset coming back in. So your typical data providers that are out there, we have active discussions with them. For now, our data set is relatively proprietary and the way that we intend to drive value from it is through application as business model as opposed to selling it because that would be a relatively different business. Yeah, our approach is going to be different based on the market. Uh, we likely will have infrastructure that we own and operate in certain markets, uh, and we're hoping not to have infrastructure that we open or operate in the vast majority of markets. It's the same way that Coca-Cola doesn't own most of the botting plants that it starts off working with. It's not a critical element of the, the value chain once you have a partner that knows what they're doing. Uh, the progression that we're going to be moving towards is focusing on markets that have the same level of cultural impact or somewhere near it along with some level of maturity. So Nevada, for example, after they come out with the supply glut over the next whatever number of months, which I, th I think is what we're expecting to see in the market, prices start to go like this and you actually have good retail out there, that's a good time for a brand company to enter in. So you're probably going to see actually, and we we're talking about this in just a handful of days ago with somebody, but our entry into a market is likely going to be correlated with the price of cannabis coming to a level where it's not artificially bloated and inflated. That's going to be your best barometer of when a market is reaching a mature state and a competitive state. In Nevada right now, $2,000 plus a pound is still in the bloat state. We're likely going to see that come into half from what we understand and predict uh, over the next six months to a year. And so that's a perfect time to enter. Massachusetts, another market that I like for the cultural element. Still early. We're going to need to see some more build up before it makes sense because otherwise we're going to be there building the market while we're trying to build brands and that's just not a good position to be in. I think that's it. Thanks very much everybody.